Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Friends, uh, welcome back to the understanding of introductory rural sociology, continuity and change. Uh, basically, we are dealing with unit 2 that is on theorizing peasantry and uh, we are going to take up unit 5th that is debating peasantry. I think uh, debating peasantry is going to be very crucial uh, because it tries to see the discussion uh, which highlights the work of Theodor Shannon and other regarding the theoretical understanding of the peasantry. I think debating peasantry itself is going to be very uh, vast uh, coverage of uh, knowledge about the rural society because when we try to speak, speak about the rural peasantry as we discussed earlier also that peasantry is going to be an important issue and that way we try to see the discussion uh, which we have to see with regard to the peasantry has to be seen uh, with regard to the understanding of the villages. And uh, I think uh, debating peasantry itself is going to bring about certain important issues like uh, it will try to highlight that how uh, the peasantry has been understood at the various levels. And uh, this is not simply that how peasantry has been seen in India. We are basically trying to speak about uh, the issue uh, which is to be seen uh, across the globe. And that way I think uh, this unit fifth uh, on the debating peasantry is going to speak about these particular issues. So, let us start up with the basic things that society is collectively of different categories of people which we try to see in the rural society. The collectivities are identified on the basis of their economic background, environment in which they are living and on the basis of their specific origin and many other aspects. Thus, the collectivity is marked by the specific traits which the group of people normally shares. And as we know that the civilizational project of the world is not uniform, so the formation of categories of society also varies in the time and space. Even the prioritization and the conceptualization of the terms in the social sciences is also different. Thus, one has to trace the genesis of peasantry historically and also to analyze the various studies conducted in this direction. We know that the broad division of society is rural or urban society. The rural in a broader terms includes the folk people like the tribes and the peasants whereas the urban society is marked by the elite people. Here our basic concern is the peasant so that let us focus upon these categories of the people especially in terms of their specific culture, customs and traditions. To be precise, even the rural sociology in United States have also not focused much upon the peasantry. As we know that it is one of the developed nations, but it does not focus upon the peasantry at that period of time. The systematic study of peasantry originated in the central and the eastern Europe because in those societies a rapidly westernizing intelligentsia was faced by a large peasantry. The issue of peasantry became closely entangled with and impelled forward by the ideologies of modernization and the rediscovery of the national self by people suppressed by Russia, Austria, German and Turkish empires. Subsequently, the political leaders, social scientists and the scores of amateur ethnographers turned their attention to the peasants which has been highlighted by Theodore Shannon. So, firstly let us understand the definition of peasants. Although we have tried to speak about the peasant, uh, what the peasant is in the previous unit also, but for just having the closer understanding about the peasant in a different way, let us try to see how we can see peasant from the various viewpoints. The first systematic attempt to define the concept of peasant came from Kroeber. To him, peasant constitutes part societies with part culture. They are definitely rural yet live in relation to the market towns. When he wrote these lines, 
Grover was thinking primarily of European peasantry. With some exceptions, almost all anthropologists subscribe to the Grover's part society, part culture definition of peasants, but are different in a different way. Uh, Raymond Firth finds that the term peasants has primarily has an economic referent and said that the primary means of livelihood of peasant is cultivation of soil. Redfield felt that the word peasant points to the human type. It requires the city to bring into its existence the larger society of which peasants are part is urban society. He also speaks about the great traditions and the little traditions to distinguish the cultures of elite and the peasants. Foster described the peasant society as half society, a part of larger social units which is vertically and horizontally structured. Raymond Fitt, he defines peasantry as a system of small producers with a simple technology and equipments and often relying primarily for their subsistence on what they themselves produce. Feller, he viewed them as a society in which the primary constituent units are semi-autonomous local communities with semi-autonomous culture. Chenov, I think uh, his understanding, A.V. Chenov's understanding is quite uh, 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 what you can say significant with regard to the peasantry. He understands peasantry by focusing upon the pure family farm. He claims the family is equipped with the means of production, uses its labor power to cultivate the soil and receive certain amount of goods as a result of year's work. Karl Marx has talked about the peasantry as a small holding of peasants that forms a vast mass whose members live in a similar conditions without entering into the manifold relations with one another. Their mode of production also isolates them from one and another instead of bringing them into the mutual intercourse. And finally, we have the Theodor Shannon's understanding who defines peasantry as those peasantry are those consisting of small agriculture producers who with the help of simple equipments and labor of their families produce mainly for their own consumptions and fulfill the obligations of the holders of political and the economic power. So, we try to see that the different scholars especially have tried to see the different aspect of peasantry. We try to see that for some peasantry was seen in terms of the cultural lines, for some it was been seen in terms of the economic lines and for some it was seen as a peasantry which is to be seen in terms of having a specific polity. So, virtually we try to see that there are different facets in which we can see the peasantry. So, the concept of peasant society is going to be very different from uh, what we try to see in a normal understanding that rural in order to understand rural uh, especially in terms of the folk understanding the present society is going to play a crucial role. So, the above definitions about the way by the various social scientists emphasize the various dimensions of understanding the presence. The few definitions talks on the cultural dimensions as I said some of them has the economic dimensions and some of them has the political manifestation of the peasantry. In the framework of thought which accept both the brief of sociology as a generalizing science and the existence of peasantry as a specific worldwide type of social structure, we can discern four major conceptual traditions which have influenced the academics. They are first one is the Marxist class theory. The Marxist tradition of class analysis has approached peasantry in terms of the power relationship that is as the suppressed and the exploited producers of pre-capitalistic society. The contemporary peasantry appears to as a leftover of the earlier social formation, its characteristics reinforced by remaining at the bottom of the social power structure. Second form can be the specific economy typology, the specific economy typology. It has been viewed that present social structure is to be determined by a specific type of economy and the crux of which lies in the way of the family farm operates. And this approach was first made explicit by Vassil Chekhov and later on it was fully developed by Chenov in the later phase. The third aspect is the ethnographic cultural traditions. It stems from the European ethnography and from the traditional western anthropology. It tends to focus its approach 
of peasantry as the representative of the earlier national traditions and preserved as a cultural lag by the inertia typical of the peasant society. And the last one is the Durkheminian tradition, the Durkheminian traditions which originated from the ideas of Durkheim and who has followed a complex path. The basic dualism accepted by Durkheim and his generation that is by Tony's and Mene was that he divides the societies into the traditional and modern or organic and based upon the division of labor and the necessary interaction of the units, Krober later placed peasant societies in an intermediate position as the part society with part culture. And that is how we try to see that the open segment in a town centered society that has been talked by Krober. So, Shannon tries to delimit the peasant society by establishing a general type with the four basic facets. And I think these four, four basic facets are going to be very crucial for understanding the peasant society. To him, the general type of peasant peasantry would include, first thing is the peasant family farm as the basic unit of multidimensional social organization. The family provides the labor on the farm and the farm pro provides for the consumption needs of the family and the payment of its duties to the holders of political and economic power. The economic action is closed closely and interwoven with the family relations and the motive of profit maximization in the money terms seldom appears in an explicit form. The self perpetuating family farm operates as a major unit of the peasant property socialization, sociability and welfare with the individual property socialization and also with the welfare of the individual tending to submit to the formalized family that is the role behavior. The second characteristics which have been po uh, proposed by uh, Theodore Shannon is the land husbandry as the main means of livelihood directly providing the major part of the consumption needs. It includes the traditional farming includes a specific combination of the task on a relatively low level of specialization and the family based vocational training. The third component which has been talked by Theodore Shannon is the specific traditional culture related to the way of life of the small communities and the specific cultural features of the peasant marked by the traditional and the conformist attitudes that is the justification of individual action in terms of the past experiences and the will of the community. And the last one is very crucial that is the underdog position, the domination of the peasantry by the outsiders. Peasantries as a rule have been kept at the arm length from the social sources of power. Their political subjection interlinks with the cultural subordination and with their economic exploitation through the tax rent interest. So, with the above frameworks in mind which has been spoken by Theodore Shannon, let us try to understand the peasantry as has been overviewed historically and in the academic discussion. To be specific, the peasantry has been traditionally treated as homogeneous category with respect to the class. The discussion on peasantry as a class started during the last century with its characteristics and political potentialities among the Marxian and the non-Marxian social scientists. Thus, one set of scholars considered the peasantry as a homogeneous category with respect to its structure and stratification. Another group of scholars questioned the prevailing misconception in terms of stratification with respect to the certain criteria differentiating the various classes of peasantry. Thus, the contribution of various scholars on the concept of peasantry as a class highlighted the homogeneous class characteristics of the peasantry. The anthropologist in general had the European had seen that the European peasant in the mind and when they expressed their views and Chenov and Marx took the Russian and the French peasantry respectively, then they talked of peasantry as a class. They never tried to differentiate the classes within the peasantry. So, either it is a question of Marx uh, or Chenov, they did not try to have the differentiation within the peasantry. The first systematic attempt to dif differentiate the classes within the peasantry, it came from Lenin. So, it was V. I. Lenin who had 
try to spoke about the differentiation of the class within the peasantry. He recognized the heterogeneous class characteristics of the peasantry. So, Lenin in 1920 talks of the six different agrarian classes in terms of ownership of means of production and the labor exploitation and those are the agricultural pro proletariates, semi proletariates, small peasantry, middle peasantry and the big land owners. Uh, Mio in 1933 differentiated the peasantry in terms of the ownership of means of production and exploitation in the form of wage labor and the market forces. He talks of the five differentiated agrarian class that is the landlord, the rich peasant, the middle peasant, the poor peasant and the workers. Barrington Moore in 1966 had tried to look into the understanding of class of peasantry in terms of superordination and subordination. Similarly, Eric Wolf tried to uh, concretize the ingredient necessary to identify the class of peasantry in a clear manner. According to him, the peasants are a subordinate ruled exploited classes and their surplus is being appropriated through the rent and the market forces. In his book, Types of Latin American Peasantry in 1955, he says that land is a critical variable for understanding the peasantry. Later on in another book entitled Peasants, he remarked that peasants are the rural cultivators whose surplus are transferred to a dominant group of rulers. Here he introduced the concept of exploitation to differentiate peasantry. Later he defined peasants in his book entitled Peasants War in the 20th century in 1971 as a population that are essentially involved in cultivation and make autonomous decision regarding the process of cultivation. A breakthrough in the conception of peasantry came from the work of Landsberger when in 1974 when he tried to look at it in terms of the socio-economic and the political dimension. He remarked that there is a landed upper class which is recognized legally and the classes below it are subordinate socially, economically and politically. According to him, the peasantry of uh, the class of peasantry is subordinate one in and occupies a lower position in all the three dimensions. The above discussion reveal the economic class characteristics of peasant and does not speak about its transformation in a political class. But Lenin and Mio analysis of class served as the basis for the analysis of the political potentialities of various classes of peasantry. Their analysis serve as a powerful tool to differentiate the agrarian class and to identify the class of peasantry as a whole. So as long as the class of peasantry remain confined to their economic interest, it will remain in class in itself. Increasingly, awareness, the increasing awareness of their plight leads to acquire the political characteristics in order to understand or to register their protest against the exploiting subordinating ruling class. In view of that, the economic class get transformed into the political class and obtain the characteristics of class for itself. So virtually there is a shift from class in itself to class for itself when they try to have certain amount of political uh, uh, consideration into con concern. So regarding the political dimension of class, the peasantry in history has many times acted politically as, as the class like the social entity. It has assumed the great importance especially during the early and the later part of the current century. The revolutionary potentialities of peasantry have been revealed in the fo following revolutions. One is the Mexican revolution of 1910, the Russian revolution of 1905 and 1917, the Chinese revolution from 1921 onwards and the Cuban revolution of 1958 and the Algerian revolution of 1954 and others. Several scholars like Franz Fanon, Lenin, Mayo, Hamza Alvi, Eric Wolf and others have recognized the revolutionary potentialities of the class of peasantry. Thus, we try to see that how the peasantry as a political class reveals a revolutionary potential and rela uh, relative 
militancy of classes within the peasantry. In other words, the class in itself, the economic class transforms to the class for itself when it becomes aware for their class consciousness. Now, in order to understand the present, we have to see that how we can locate present in terms of a history. And here, we will try to speak about the presentology's history. The genesis of presentry has to be evolved by digging the history and civilization of different societies. One has to interpret its genesis by training the, significant, the significance of present studies in the different era. As given by Shannon in 1971, in the pre-industrial world, the literate attitude of peasants combined with hostility and with silence. It seems that they had also to be dehumanized in the consciousness of those who ruled, administered and wrote. Even the medieval writings are full of kings and wars, of philosophies and poetry, of law and astrology. They are mostly silent about the present. So, if you try to see on an average, the peasantry has been missing in terms of the discourse, in terms of discussion. Regarding the connotation of peasants, the declinatio rustica of 13th century defined the sixth interpretation of the word peasant. The villain, rustic, devil, robber, brigand and looter and in the plural sense, the wretches beggar, liars, rogues, trash and infidels. So, in the 18th century English, a peasant meant a brute and an illiterate, while the verb to peasant was to mean to subjugate or to enslave. So, I think this is what or how the word was trying to see the peasant, the understanding of peasant in terms of uh, a certain academic reference. The modernity and the capitalism came to Europe with the triple revolution of industrialization of the citizenship within the nation state and the spread of the secular. And we try to see that in the most fundamental self image, uh, this word was a word without the presence. So, the word the present was missing in this particular word of science based secular uh, nation. Presence were treated as anarchism and therefore, as irrelevant with regard to their existence in the society. However, the way the presents were approached in the scholarly endeavor different deeply at least in the three global regions. Now, we can see that how peasantry has been reflected in the three uh, global regions across the world. The first global region uh, that is basically the popularly and the scholarly consciousness of the industrial west was dominated by the historiography come typology dividing the social world into the modern and backward. On such an intellectual map, the actual present disappeared even more effectively than in the olden days under the remainders of the past. When at the turn of the century, the rural sociology emerged as a sub-discipline, it focused on farming as an occupation disregarding the present as a social entity. So, this is how the first global region basically the industrial west was trying to see uh, the world of peasantry. The second uh, global region, the polar opposite of the west was the colonies or the orients. There, the life seems to be trickled more slowly, the hand of the state to have the heavier than the modern science. The fact that the very often 9 to 10th of the population were peasants mattered little to the local literate. So, the second global region that is basically the colonies were having the plenty of uh, peasantry, but nobody tried to focus upon the peasantry in terms of uh, a social entity. The third global region that is the eastern and the central Europe, where the studies of peasantry as such blossomed at the turn of the century. In those countries, a highly sophisticated intelligentsia politically committed to nationalism faced massive peasantries, policies and the ideologies turned attention to the present majorities as the major object, the possible carrier on or the main bottleneck of the necessary advances have been seen. By the eve of the first world war and the later, the intellectual political intellectuals political attempt to look at and to activate the peasantries were being increasingly matched by the peasants own effort to establish 
the viable political movement in defense of their own interest in Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Russia and other countries. East European is in much of its rural experiences produced some inspired writings and in the rural scene especially the work by Karl Marx, Max Weber, Somwart, Kotaski, Buchners and David they are quite significant. It was Denmark which became for a time the prime sample of the autonomous and successful rural cooperatives movement and a self generated innovation by the peasant smallholders. The world war followed by the rapid decolonization changed the global map and its political power. The growing gap of the wealth and the power came eventually to be theorized by new image and models which were well represented by the simultaneous, simultaneity of the appearance of the medals concept of cumulation of advancement and backwardness and Paul Barron's the political economy of backwardness. The developing societies became synonymous with dependency. Social scientists, politicians and planners were made to turn their attention from the purely economic indices to the particularities of the social structure of the developing societies. A majority of them there were peasants. Further, the right and the left scholars, politicians and the revolutionaries were turning their attention towards the peasant and the peasant societies. A virtual explosion of the present studies in the late 1960s was much part of the new political situation as a major conceptual refocusing which reads its symbolic peak in the 1968. So, virtually we try to see that by 1968 we try to see that the establishment of peasantry in terms of an academic discourse had started germinating or coming to the picture. With this background a new theoretical armory was rapidly set up consisting of some of the old par partly forgotten texts by Thomas and Zanarki, Karl Marx, V. I. Lenin, Sorokin, Krober and others. The work of Chenov that is the theory of present economy 1966 and Karl Marx work that is Grandersee of 19, in 1964 were highlighted. A number of integrative work by Eric Wolf, Theodor Shenin and also by Galaski established the basic parameters of contemporary present studies. Defining presents became a matter of major significance and in offering the field study in the field. The continuous debate of the three decades and a variety of application within the social planning made the field of present studies gather extensive evidences and grow in sophistication. It resulted into revitalism of the old orthodoxies which made present disappear and treated them as the new key to all the things unrelated to broad the broader society. Now, let us try to see that how we can have the assumptions and the meaning about the peasantry as a social phenomenon. Because uh, gradually we try to see that uh, peasantry has been seen as uh, a literary word which came and how the people were trying to use peasantry uh, that has been referred in the English dictionary and later on how the peasantry has been ignored by the various world across the globe especially we try to see that the central and the western uh, uh, Europe, uh, eastern Europe they basically try to focus upon the understanding of the peasantry because there they try to uh, the academia basically they try to focus upon the understanding of the peasantry. So, the assumption of the meaning of the peasantry as a so social phenomenon becomes very significant. To Shannon, there are three fundamental ways to approach contemporary peasantry as a social phenomenon. The first to assume that we do not encounter it a distinguishable set of related characteristics which can be analytically treated as a type of social structure. It would therefore, be a notion of no conceptual significance just a word possibly a linguistic reminder of the historical past. Consequently, there could also be no place for a theory concerning the peasants particularities. The second is to assume that peasants differ consistently from the non peasants in a way which are socially significant, but that this diversity can and should be fully explicated within the existing body of general theory by extending its application. Thirdly, one can assume that present distinctiveness exists as well as 
that conceptually particularly must follow from it the most effective way is to analyze the present is to establish and use to that purpose discrete in a specific theoretical structure. This would mean consideration of present economies within the with the help of present economics as a distinctive section of discipline of economics and a similar proce uh, procedure for some other dimensions of social structure and actions are to be used. One can present and suggest the three fundamental categories of approach which can be graphically represented uh, in the form of how the categories of uh, uh, analysis of contemporary peasantry can be seen. Like if you try to see that uh, we have the characteristics, uh, we have the approach 1, we have the approach 2 and then we have the approach 3. So, we try to see that uh, this particular understanding has to be seen in this particular framework and then we try to see that the characteristics can, has to be classified at two levels. One is the distinctiveness of presence and another is the theoretical distinctiveness of presenthood. So, in terms of characteristics on the x axis we have the distinctiveness of presence and also the theoretical distinctiveness of the presenthood. In terms of approach we have three approaches we can have three possibilities approach 1, approach 2 and approach 3 on the y axis. So, we try to see that uh, uh, in approach 1 uh, both the things are negative it means that neither there is distinctiveness of presence nor there is a theoretical distinctiveness of presentry. In approach to in the second framework we have distinctiveness of presence, but we do not, but uh, the theoretical distinctiveness of presenthood is missing that is no. So, we have the first combination the first approach which is both no no. In approach to we have distinctiveness yes, but theoretical distinctiveness no and in the approach 3 we have the distinctiveness of presence that is also yes and theoretical distinctiveness of presenthood that is also yes. So, the last category that is the category 3 basically represents the ideal condition for the representation of presentry as a social entity. Now, if we analyze the different works they are can be placed in different approaches. For example, Lenin's work on the theory on the development of capitalism in Russia in 1899 and McNamara's attempt of using presence can be placed in approach to in approach 1 and Kotaski's agrarian question and Schultz analysis through the intermediary in between approach 1 and 2. And we can see that the theory of present economy by Chenov can fall into the category 3 because he tries to speak about the uh, understanding of distinctiveness of presentry also and also the theoretical understanding about the presentry. So, both the things have been talked about by Chenov. So, he can be placed in the category 3 and his famous work the theory of present economy. I think we are going to discuss this particular work uh, maybe in the coming lectures uh, where you can have the detailed understanding about the things. So, virtually we try to see that uh, by going through the above discussions we have got the following framework regarding the genesis of presentry. The concept of presence has to be analyzed through the cross cultural analysis of global history. We find that the pre industrial world could not recognize the peasantry in a healthier way, whereas in the industrial era, the industrial West were considering them to be the backward, whereas the colonial countries were not in a position to recognize peasantry because nine tenth of the population belonged to that category. However, it was the European nation which was emphasizing on the relevance of present studies. Further, the agenda of present studies in 1960s and 70s were the presentry's disappearance, the response of presence to the market economies and also the power of present to bend the state policies. So, here I think uh, we try to see that uh, uh, there is a gradual shift which has started emerging like when presentry were to be seen in terms of uh, the social entity. Uh, in order to understand them as a social entity we have to see that to what extent we are in a position to discuss or put them theoretically. Like uh, we discussed about the Chenev's work uh, on the theory of present economy uh, that is the only work which tries to give the distinctiveness of peasantry both theoretically and in terms of their existence in the social world. So, the, so the economic impact of the state increasingly became focused 
uh, uh, became focus attention through the recognition of the exceptional significance of the state institutions and personals in the rural areas where the peasantries plays a major role. So, we have to see that to what extent we are in a position to speak about the peasantry like uh, we try to speak about the peasantry in terms of uh, uh, the broader framework, we try to see that how the peasantry was been seen across the globe, we try to see that how people were serious about putting the peasantry into the social map. So, I think uh, these are the serious issues uh, which one has to see uh, that is going to affect the understanding of the peasantry. But more important is that uh, the peasantry are to be seen as uh, uh, from homogeneous to heterogeneous that becomes a serious issue. Like when we said that uh, the initial scholars they were trying to see peasantry as homogeneous category and gradually we try to find out that most of the scholars they were trying to see that how peasantry were being seen as homogeneous, they were seen as uh, docile, they were seen as the objects uh, who does not have a bigger say. And uh, I think uh, if you try to recall the contribution of Shannon, Shannon was trying to see them as having the underdog position whereby they does not have much influence on the economic and the social uh, uh, economic and the political holders of the power. So, we try to see that uh, the peasantry which has been seen by the various scholars, they have uh, different uh, 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 they have the different perception about looking to the peasantry. Uh, one of course is the cultural viewpoint, another of course is the social viewpoint, another is the economic viewpoint and another uh, format can be the political viewpoint. But out of all these, uh, the visibility of the peasantry is going to be more significant when we try to see that the peasantry is trying to reflect the political aspect. So, uh, when peasantry by themselves are going to turn into the new form that is going to be an important issue. Otherwise, the peasantry were been seen uh, by or been dictated by the uh, superordinates basically the elites and they were do not they were not trying to uh, figure the understanding of the peasantry into the specific domain. We try to see that peasantry which was basically seen as having an important element of uh, uh, its existence within the world, but ultimately we try to see that peasantry which was basically seen is, uh, as having lesser contribution towards the economic order or towards the political order that makes the existence of the peasantry and demean the existence of the peasantry. So, we have to see that there is a need for uh, a conceptual uh, mapping of uh, the peasantry. Like when we try to speak about uh, uh, the three models which has been discussed uh, which we have talked earlier also like uh, we try to speak about that how peasantry has been seen in terms of the category of analysis. We try to see that uh, 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 peasantry can be seen in either of the way in terms of the distinctiveness of peasants or in terms of the theoretical distinctiveness of the peasanthood in both the ways they are going to be visible as a social entity. But if we try to see as an outcome in terms of analysis, we try to find out that uh, uh, one uh, possibility can be that they are neither distinctive, uh, they are not having their distinctiveness in terms of a specific social world or they do not have any theoretical distinctiveness also that we have seen. We have also seen another approach in which we have the distinctiveness of the present, but nobody has tried to uh, define it theoretically. And then we try to see another approach where we try to see the existence of the peasantry which is existing both in terms of distinctiveness and also in terms of the theoretical distinctiveness also. So, I think uh, the, the need of the hour in order to make the present visible in the uh, social map in the social world, we have to see that the peasantry has to be seen in terms of a specific category uh, which ultimately is going to have certain amount of uh, uh, what you can say reservations with regard to uh, having their own identity which is going to be visible by others that is one important thing. Another important thing of course, is that the peasantry can contribute significantly towards the wider social order that is going to be another important issue uh, because peasantry are not into the academia. So, they cannot uh, speak about by themselves as we have seen that uh, the second world uh, the second global era. 
uh, second uh, world order uh, which was full of peasantry uh, especially we are trying to speak about uh, the colonial uh, countries. So, their peasantry were huge in number, but they did not bother about uh, representing themselves at the academic level. So, we try to see that these are certain gaps uh, which we have to fill in order to understand the peasantry in a real sense. We also try to see that uh, different scholars have uh, uh, proved to put the things very differently uh, like we try to speak about starting from uh, people like Krober who try to say that uh, they represents the part society and part culture. Then also we try to see that uh, how uh, Krober was trying to see them in relation to the wider society. So, it is basically the linkage between the rural and the urban uh, which is going to be important. We also try to see that uh, Raymond Firth who was trying to speak about uh, the economic aspect and trying to see that uh, what is important for the, uh, the present is that their livelihood is based simply on the cultivation of the soil. So, I think somewhere we try to see that uh, peasantry existence has to be seen in terms of cultivation of the soil that may be the starting point. And we also try to see that uh, uh, how Chenov has tried to see by focusing simply upon the pure family farm. So, uh, Chenov was basically highlighting upon the uh, peasant's behavior uh, in terms of the family, how the family is equipped with the specific means of production uses its labor power to cultivate the soil and to receive a certain amount of goods as a result of the year work that is going to be important issue. And Karl Marx who was trying to see them not as a class, but was trying to see them as a small holding of peasants that forms a vast mass and whose members lives in a similar conditions without entering into the manifold relations. So, I think uh, what Marx was trying to put down is that. Uh, their own uh, what you can say business with their own occupation with their own uh, cultivation uh, uh, that does not make them in a comfortable position to think about themselves. So, virtually their own work is basically putting them into a condition in which they are not in a position to have certain amount of mutual intercourse and that way they are, that leads to certain amount of uh, uh, what you can say isolation uh, within the peasantry. And however, we try to see that uh, the Tudor Shannon's understanding about the peasantry is going to be significant, where we try to see that small agriculture producers, they are the small agriculture producers who with the help of the simple equipments and the use of family labor power is going to be an important issue. And how that is going to be an important issue, because uh, they are using it for their own consumptions and whatsoever they are producing uh, that is not seen as a surplus for profit making. Rather, it is basically meant for the holders of uh, for the obligations of the holders of the political and the economic power. So, we try to see that uh, these sort of understanding which has been raised by uh, people like uh, Theodore Shannon or by Karl Marx, they try to give a different meaning towards the understanding of the peasantry. And we try to see that uh, uh, Shannon has gone beyond by trying to speak about uh, the concept of peasant society, he was trying to give a different color to the peasantry, especially his famous work that is present and present society that is quite uh, 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 famous. It is an edited work which tries to incorporate various studies which has been conducted on the peasantry. And uh, I think uh, uh, when he was trying to see uh, uh, concept of present society, I think uh, we have the different viewpoints uh, which has been focused upon by uh, him. Basically, the present family farm as a basic unit of multidimensional uh, social organization that is going to be quite significant. And then we have land husbandry, uh, somewhere he has used the term that uh, for peasantry uh, land is very crucial and it is sometimes it sometimes act as an entrance ticket. So, the land uh, having land is considered to be an entrance ticket for the peasantry because the peasantry if they have to exist, so they have to have certain amount of land. And that way the cultivation of the land is going to be a sole uh, issue which makes their identity to be viable. And then I think uh, their unique culture, the traditional culture and the traditional culture which is basically seen in terms of uh, reflected in the way of life of the small communities that is again going to be very important. And then finally, their position of underdog that is basically they are being subordinate. Now, I think uh, this fourth uh, component which has been talked by Shannon, 
uh, that they cannot come into the power or sometimes they cannot uh, act as a uh, <coughs> group of peoples who can have the position of superordinate. So, they will always be subordinate. So, on the one hand we try to see that uh, one categorization of uh, a population can be peasantry and the polar opposite of that is the gentry. So, we have the peasantry and the gentry these are the two components uh, uh, these are the two uh, wider words polar opposite words uh, which are to be seen as an important aspect of the peasantry uh, which has to be reflected. We also try to see that uh, uh, the, the differentiation of the peasantry is the starting point from where we try to see that uh, uh, the understanding of the peasantry becomes important. And here I think uh, when we try to speak about the peasantry in terms of differentiation meaning thereby they are not the homogeneous categories rather they are the categories of peoples who are reflecting certain amount of differentiation on the basis of the division of labor on the basis of the class character and that was been made by V. I. Lenin. So, V. I. Lenin has spoken about the different classes uh, within the peasantry and I think uh, if you try to see uh, there is a range of uh, class which has been talked about by uh, V. I. Lenin uh, starting from the proletariates that is the agricultural labor and moving down to the another extreme of the Burgia that is the big land owners. So, I think both the extremes have been represented by Lenin uh, that they represents the uh, class within the peasantry. So, virtually we try to see that peasantry in order to uh, be a social entity, in order to be a cultural entity, in order to be an entity which can have its own existence in terms of the social mapping they are to be having certain amount of differentiation. So, trying to see peasantry as a class I think uh, becomes an important issue. We try to see that peasantry uh, which has to be uh, visible. So, they have to have certain class character, they have to have certain amount of political mobilization, they have to have certain amount of uh, political assertion only then we can say them uh, to be having a specific uh, identity. I think uh, uh, peasantry logic history itself speaks about that how peasantry was there they were existing, but they have been neglected by, by the wider world. Especially we try to see that uh, those countries where the peasantry was abundance in number. So, their peasantry has not been reflected and in some places where we try to see that peasantology was uh, not there, but there the attention was not been paid much like uh, we try to speak about the United States uh, which was considered to be the developing nations, but they never try to focus upon the peasantry uh, in terms of uh, they try to see them as the remnants of the past. Uh, in terms of uh, the specific civilizational framework. And on the other hand we try to see that uh, it was basically the, 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 the European world, the European world who was basically trying to see that how peasantry has to be seen as a distinctive entities and how it is going to be an important issue with regard to the academic discourse. So, that is where we try to see that the third global region that is the eastern and the central Europe, they basically tries to study the peasantry and uh, that has uh, uh, made the visibility of pe peasantry in academia that is going to be an important issue uh, which we have to keep in mind. I think uh, uh, that is where we try to see that uh, the categories of analysis of the contemporary peasantry they also becomes visible and we also try to see that uh, a conceptual gap has to be filled uh, uh, between the analysis of peasantry of the third world and the phenomenon of the highly capitalized far family farmers of the first world. So, I think uh, uh, this conceptual gap has to be filled between the third world countries and the first world countries. The first world has to provide the theoretical mapping or to substantiate the existence of the peasantry and the third, uh, third world countries which are having the uh, plenty of peasantries they have to reflect upon through writings through their experiences about the existence of the peasantries. Uh, in terms of the collectivities, in terms of the ruralities are going to be an important issue. So, the contemporary peasant studies have offered not only the yardstick of otherness, but also the up to date process, up to date process of defining and studying the peasants as a sociological concept. So, we try to see that the focus of peasant studies will mo <coughs> most likely to expand reflecting upon the increasing interdependence within the global society as well as 
the internal logic of the analytical paradigm. I think uh, this is where we try to see the contribution of peasantry uh, which is going to be quite significant especially when we try to speak about the peasantry in terms of existence we try to find out that peasantry they basically tries to understand the things more in terms of uh, how peasantry uh, has to be located where it has to be located. Uh, I think uh, we try to see uh, the various uh, uh, revolutions which took place uh, in various revolution uh, what is the role of peasantry that is going to be a uh, important question uh, in uh, in many uh, revolutions what is the contribution of peasantry that becomes an important question for analysis apart from that we have also to see that peasantry in terms of the leadership how many times uh, in terms of leadership uh, leadership it has uh, gone, gone to show its uh, uh, color that is again going to be an important issue and beyond that I think more important is that we have to see that peasantry in order to uh, make them uh, uh, what you can say visible uh, they have to be vocal, vocal by themselves. I think that is going to be an important issue uh, which has to be focused upon. So, basically when we try to speak about debating peasantry in terms of uh, the representation, the debating peasantry in terms of representation are to be seen not only in the words of Shannon or Karl Marx or in the works of uh, Robert Redfield or in the works of uh, uh, what you can say the understanding of Raymond Firth rather we have to see that they have to be visible both theoretically and practically. So, theoretically speaking like Chenov has spoken about the present behavior that is perfectly fine, but I think what about their practicality in terms of uh, their outcome in terms of their uh, visibility in the wider world that has to actually take place then only we can speak about the peasantry in the real sense. But what is more important is that we have also to see that peasantry are they in a position to uh, make themselves visible by themselves or there is a, the third player who is going to make them visible. I think that is another important question because uh, peasantry by their own how many times they are coming by their own to represent themselves uh, that is going to be an important issue. So, we have to see that uh, uh, the element of indigeneity. Uh, indigenous leadership I think has also to be reflected when we try to speak about the peasantry in the real sense. So, the conceptualizing peasantry in terms of the new debate and the discourse has to incorporate uh, the understanding of the peasantry in the real sense uh, which has to be visible more in terms of how it has been reflected uh, in the wider uh, society and this wider visibility has to be seen how they are trying to use the media how they are trying to use uh, the modern forces of uh, technology or the modern forces of production and on the basis of that they will be in a better position or they, they, they will be in a position to attract the attention of the world. Like I think uh, in the coming units we are going to we will talk about how the peasantry has been visible or how the peasantry has been seen by various scholars especially uh, in the so called capitalistic order in the <laughs> capitalistic order how peasantry could uh, succumb to the pressure and how they could be made visible that is one important thing that we will be uh, hearing in the coming lectures. And apart from that we also will try to see that how peasantry is going to be more important uh, from the Marxian viewpoint from the class analysis viewpoint that we are going to discuss. And I think uh, the most important thing that we are going to discuss in the coming lectures will be on the moral concern the moral econ economy concern uh, that is by James A. Scott. So, there I, I think uh, we will try to see that uh, the conceptualization of the peasantry in terms of the debate has to be seen on the various parameters. It is not simply the question of uh, the cultural representation, it has to have the class analysis, it has to have certain amount of theorization, it also to have it, it also should have certain amount of moral economy consideration also uh, which can be seen as uh, fighting against the, the global order and how they are going to make themselves visible uh, in the uh, international order that is going to be an important issue uh, which we have to really focus upon. I think uh, uh, these are certain things uh, in which uh, uh, this whole discussion uh, basically revolves around and I think uh, there are wonderful uh, works as I have quoted that uh, the work of Theodore Shannon uh, on peasant and peasant societies uh, it is a, a penguin book publication from Hermann's fourth. 
uh, that one has to really see. I think it is an additive volume which consi consists of uh, large number of uh, articles from various scholars, uh, uh, scholars like uh, Karl Marx, uh, uh, <coughs> Karble, then we have Manning Nash, uh, we have uh, the contribution by various scholars, uh, uh, Chenna for that sake or we will try to speak about Gunnar Medel's contribution or we try to speak uh, about the Shannon's contribution himself and uh, multiple contributions are there on various segments uh, which are been reflected in uh, this work present and present societies. Then also I think uh, we have to see Shannon's another important contribution that is defining presence that is going to be another crucial work uh, which we have to see. And uh, apart from that I think uh, in order to see present in terms of a specific category we have to speak about the contribution of Eric Wolf. Eric Wolf's contribution in terms of presence I think uh, that speaks about the peasantry, how peasantry has been seen in the industrializing world that is again going to be a crucial work uh, which one has to see. And then also we have Robert Redfield's contribution on peasant society and culture that is by University of Chicago. So I think uh, uh, peasant society and culture is another significant work uh, which we have to see in order to make ourselves uh, clear about the understanding of the peasantry in terms of culture, in terms of economy, in terms of polity. So, I think uh, uh, this uh, discussion on theorizing peasantry which is basically uh, the important uh, theme of uh, what you can say the rule of sociology continuity and change. Here I think uh, this uh, unit, unit fifth basically which is debating peasantry it has dealt uh, a lot with the discussions so highlighting the works of uh, people like Theodore Shannon, uh, V. I. Lenin, Karl Marx or we try to speak about the contribution of Shenov for that sake and many others how they try to see the theoretical understanding of the peasantry uh, in the wider world in the wider understanding that is going to be an important issue. And more importantly we have to see that to what extent we are in a position to make present uh, more visible. I think uh, uh, the whole idea of debating peasantry is that we have not only to see them uh, theoretically we have not simply to uh, define it but also we have to see that how peasantry can be made visible both in the academia and in the live world. So, in the visible world how the peasantry are to be reflected because that is the only way in which we can feel that peasantry the discussion on the peasantry can be live. So, I think uh, we have to see that we have to uh, uh, reflect the peasantry in the global era, we have to reflect the peasantry in the modern uh, uh, in the modern uh, technology era in that sense we have to reflect uh, the peasantry which is to be visible in terms of the new cultures, the new uh, trends of society which are coming up and the peasantry are not to be seen simply as the disappearing entity, they should not be seen as the remnant of the past rather they are to be seen more in terms of how peasantry is going to be uh, playing a crucial role with regard to the understanding of the wider world and the peasantry. So, I think uh, this is uh, what uh, we have to deal with and I think uh, this particular discussion going to make you clear about uh, how the peasantry has been seen from the viewpoint of a social scientist and uh, how uh, the peasantry has to be seen on what can be the futuristic uh, line of action in which the peasantry are to be seen and made visible. So, I think uh, uh, with these words uh, I will stop it here and I think uh, uh, through the interaction and further discussions we will try to make it more clear about how or why the peasantry is crucial when we try to speak about the rural sociology and when we try to speak about the understanding of uh, uh, the rural society. So, how or why peasantry becomes important. So, I think these debates are going to be crucial uh, for understanding uh, the relevance of a peasant in the rural society. Thank you to all of you.